This week on Intrigued, Full Effect. Wow, the impact, I tell you, the bullet shattered the family structure when it comes to a death, a murder. It breaks the family down. I'm Shandrea Thomas, and welcome to episode 19. In this podcast, I talk about curious cases, disappearances, and other stuff. And today I'm talking about the curious case and murder of 23-year-old Kendra Smith from Washington, D.C., In 2004, Kendra, a new mom of a baby girl, was shot while sitting inside of a car with a male friend. And now, 15 years later, that same man was recently charged with her murder. I spoke to Kendra's mother, and I reached out to police and the man charged in the case along with his attorney. This is what happened. It was just after 10 p.m. on September 6, 2004, at the 4300 block of D Street on the southeast side of Washington, D.C. According to family members, Kendra has spent the day with her family for the Labor Day weekend and planned to meet up with her friend, Tony Aiken, afterwards. At some point, she got into a car with him, and within minutes, shots were fired. This is what Kendra's mother, Deborah Evans Bailey, had to say about that night and the aftermath. All right, Deborah Evans Bailey, thank you for taking the time to talk with me today about your daughter's case. It's been about 14 years now. Um, Tell me what happened to your daughter. And for those who may not be familiar with exactly what happened with Kendra's case, give give us a full scope of what happened. Well, um, September 6, 2004, Kendra was sitting outside of my home with a neighborhood associate. That particular day was actually Labor Day. That whole day, Kendra, my youngest daughter, Courtney, and my granddaughter was together that whole day, basically going to different cookouts, family member homes, just visiting that whole day. Uh, Towards the evening portion of the day, she was receiving a phone call from the neighborhood associate who basically said he wanted to see her. It had started started to get late in the hour and she basically told him she had to work the following day she would give him a few minutes and that's exactly what happened they made arrangements for him to basically meet her at my house and my granddaughter and my youngest daughter came in the house my granddaughter was an arm baby she wasn't even one years old at that point. So Kendra basically gave Courtney, my youngest daughter, the baby, her purse, the diaper bag. They came in the house. Courtney brought the baby upstairs, put her in a bed with me. She went in her back room. I never knew that Kendra didn't come in the house. A few minutes later, maybe three minutes later, I heard gunshots. A few minutes after that, maybe three minutes, four minutes after that, someone who I still don't know called my phone and said, come up, come up to Burbank. I think your daughter got shot. At that point, I just went into autopilot. I went downstairs and hollered for my brother to follow me. Basically jumped into some jeans. I actually left the baby in the bed and I just took flight and went to Burbank, which is a street around the corner from where I live at today. So what happened when you got to Burbank? What did you see? What was the situation? When I got around to Burbank, I saw a lot of people. And I went to the crowd basically asking who called me because I don't um, really know anybody even to this day on that street. And people started grabbing me, trying to hold me. I never saw Kendra in the beginning, and I just happened to t- take a glance to my right, and that's when I saw Kendra on a gurney, and they were actually putting her into the ambulance. So in order, I didn't see her on the street. I didn't see a car. I just saw people, and when I made that turn, just slightly to my right, that's when I... I never saw Amalams. I never heard of Amalams. But when I made that turn to my right, that's when I seen my girl on that um, gurney getting into the Amalams. 
So what was going through your mind when you saw your daughter getting into, you know, being put into the, into the ambulance with the, you know, with what happened? What was going through my mind was, number one, who called me? And number two, what what happened? How could this happen? Did you ever find out who called you? Did you ever try to, you know, ever figure out the mystery of that? Well, from my understanding, the person who she met, the neighborhood associate, drove around a corner and apparently went into a house and asked someone to call the police. And and even with that point itself, it took some time for me to even figure out how my daughter ended up on Burbank. If she was getting out of her car and I, and I actually saw her car facing one direction, it baffled me to find out how she turned around the corner in a, in a whole different direction. So what actually happened was once Courtney brought the baby in the house, Kendra had parked her car, got in the car with the neighborhood associate. He actually did a U-turn, turned his car around facing an opposite way. And from what I was told or have been told, he was trying to get away when he heard the gunshots. But mother wants to know, if someone is shooting fire, why you stop short around a corner? Why you didn't go to the police de- department? Why you didn't go to the fire department? Why you didn't go further to try to find some kind of safety? And I still have that question to this day, 14 years and a half, and it actually will be 15 years in September. So here's a question. So the neighborhood associate that you're talking about, is that the same person who police were charging with her murder years later? That happened like late last year, right? November the 1st, the same person who was in the car, yes, the neighborhood associate was arrested for Kendra being murdered. He actually was charged with second degree murder. I am currently in the process of going back and forth to court and we've been doing status hearings. So I do have now a trial date. He was formally charged on March the 21st, 2019. Okay. Who was charged? The neighborhood associate. You don't want to say his name? No. Understandable. Oh, well, you know, it's public information. His name is Tony Aiken, capital A-I-K-E-N. So let me ask you this. Um, Did you know, was she in a relationship with this person? What do you know about her relationship with this guy? Was he a new person that came around or what's, what's happening there? From my understanding, they were friends. I had to learn that through Courtney, my youngest daughter. I didn't know the extent of friends. I do understand she was a grown woman. And I do understand that I'm not privy as mother to know all her business. Mm -hmm. And so at this time, um, Aiken was how old? I mean, how much older than her was he? Ten years older. Okay, so we have a guy who's 10 years older than your daughter, flying her back and forth, having some sort of relationship with her, be it a close, close friendship or whatever the situation may be. But you never really knew of him. So your first really, I guess, encounter or understanding of who he is was after the shooting, basically. There was one there was one occasion where Kendra and Tony was sitting in front of my house eating carry out food. At that point, I asked her, I, I was just pulling up in my car to park my car. And I was like, why, why are you in the car? We just eating. And my response to her, you don't, you don't eat in the car. You don't date in the car. He still haven't been in my house. He has never been to my house to sit at my dinner table. He was never an, an invited guest. I knew of him being in the neighborhood. I've always heard of him in different situations in the neighborhood. I've heard that he had been in situations where he would get incarcerated and then back out. And more than two times, more than three times, to be honest with you. Every time I would hear such a thing, and poof, he'd be back out in the street. And I say that because I'm still living in the same house, have no intention on moving, but if I go around to the corner store, poop, he'd be there. If I drive my car around Burbank, I would see him. 
I would see him in the geographical vicinity often, so much so that I stopped going to the corner store. I stopped going to Burbank Street because that's something that I didn't want to see. I would see him on one occasion that really upset me coming down my street, coming home, and he walking down the street with ice cream in his hand. And that really bothered me because my thought was, and I'm a human being just like everybody else, how and why are you walking around with ice cream? And my daughter is dead. That was how I felt. And that leads me to my next question. Did he ever come to you and offer condolences? Did you ever hear from this man to say, I'm sorry about your daughter? Did you ever get any communication from him after the, the night that she was shot? Not the night that she was shot, but there was there was a meeting where he agreed to meet myself, Kendra's dad, a couple of houses down on my street. My my godmother actually lived on this street. She cleared her house and the three of us met there. We had the conversation and he said he don't know what happened. He didn't see anybody coming at him. He offered nothing. And that really rang crazy to me. And that's another thing, too, because I'm, I'm wondering, OK, when you have a situation like this, we're talking about gunshots in a neighborhood. I'm assuming there's multiple people and eyes and ears who can hear all of this. What are people in the neighborhood saying about what they may have seen or, or what people think may have been the situation there? Because, you know, eventually something starts to leak out as far as theories of, of what people think happened and why. What, what have you heard from that standpoint? Me personally, I, I'm I'm disappointed in my community. I've I've been told by the police that some people did offer some information, and of course that those people haven't been um, the names haven't been communicated to me. But you would think that on a holiday, any holiday on a calendar, that somebody is doing something. Even even if you have a situation when people are on their way home, people still putting a grill situations up or um telling a company i see you later or what have you the street and my community have had that shut down i don't know if that fall under the um stop no the snitching thing that's um prevalent in our area and not just dc but in areas period i'm not sure what that's about but i am disappointed that the community shut down when it came to my daughter's murder. And that's what's interesting, too, because a lot of times, you know, it's been 14 plus years. Sometimes things tend to slip out or someone says something, you know, if they get hemmed up with some sort of situation, they'll, you know, give, you know, give up some details about something. But you haven't had any of that happen over all this time. As far as I'm concerned, not enough. Um, and I'll and I'll say what I just said. The police had said that some people had given information. I don't know if that led to the arrest, but that should have happened a long time ago. I'm grateful now that there has been an arrest and I have to let due process take its course. However, Kendra meant so much to not just me, but the community. This girl would get the kids, ride bikes with the kids, take the grill, put the hot dogs on the grill for the kids. The kids the younger kids would knock on my door, ring my bell, asking for Kendra opposed to her sister, who is nine years younger than her. Courtney was 15. Kendra was 23. She had that attitude and character about herself, but she was a loving person. That's just who she was. I don't understand why the shutdown took place. But that's just something that that's just something that happened in this case. Now, now, you know, let me ask you this. When it came to this shooting, right, because I saw some news stories that showed like there was some bullet holes still in someone's car and things like that <laughs> way years later. So how was that? I'm like, this, was it supposedly like was your daughter shot inside of the car or was she shot like on the street? She was actually inside the car. OK, so so basically from, from what I was able to see. So the bullet I'm just I'm just so I'm kind of clear about, you know, what what may have happened. So because when I saw the picture of the car, there was a bullet hole like in the back light tail light of a car and things like that, like it would have come from the back. I don't know if it came from the front to the back or the back to the front. 
I was told different things. Uh, the first uh, set of police who was assigned to her case gave me a whole scenario and basically told me that Kendra was shot on the left side of her temple. If she's in the passenger side, that means that somebody was on the outside of the car on the passenger side where the bullet entered. That wasn't the case. It was years before I can even go through the autopsy. It actually took the new assigned police officer to ask me, do you know where your daughter was shot? And I said, yes. And I repeated what I just said to you. And I also said, I have the autopsy upstairs. I'll go get it. He said, you don't have to go get it. I have it. Your daughter was shot on the right side of the temple while sitting in the passenger side of the car. So that, so that tells you what? That tells me that the first set of police officers did not tell the truth to me. That tells me that somewhere I should have made myself read the entire autopsy. And that also tells me that the story that I was told wasn't true, period. I can't say that it came from the driver's side because they said that the back window was shattered. From my understanding, because the car is now gone, that was the only shatter. For whatever reason, the police should have kept the car as evidence for one. The car sat on the police impoundment lot for years. Now they're saying that the car is just gone. It has been sold. I don't know who's the rightful owner of the car. I was told it was his brother. But I'm simply saying that I don't believe none of them now. The, the new detectives that I have now working on her case, I feel more powerful with him and more, and I have more trust with him than I ever had of the first detective. I was even called, Kendra's dad and myself was even called into the office, the police department, and was told that a person shot Kendra. But they didn't know that I knew that that person was deceased. And I just really displayed to him, okay, well, if you feel like he killed Kendra, then show me proof. Until you show me proof, then I'm not going with that because dead people can't talk. You want to put something on a dead person and they don't have no defense. And this little boy, I knew him. And I know that in my heart, I didn't feel that that was the case. And I still don't and, and won't believe that. Wow. So it sounds like the investigation, as far as your feelings about it, it wasn't didn't go well in the beginning. And it seems to be getting back on track now, considering everything that's happened. Absolutely. I don't think that, I think Kendra's case wasn't handled professionally. I think that the police officer who handled her case didn't do what he should have done as it relates to finding the truth. That's what I believe. Let's switch gears a little bit. Tell me about your daughter, where she was in her life, and what her goals were. Kendra, at 23, was gainfully employed, number one, and she loved family. She would go and get children, cousins, little little nieces and nephews, and bring them over. And we had a house full of kids, but that's the person who she was. Education was very much of a part of Kendra's DNA, and that's because she always wanted greater. And I appreciate that. I made sure that I was the mom that took my kids to church, and I sent my kids to church, and it is a difference. I do understand that it's important to get it, that foundation, that religious, that, that, that spiritual connection. But I wanted to experience that with my children. Now, as far as um, what was her major? Communications. Okay, she was a communications major. Yeah. So tell, tell me about the impact that her murder has had on your family and how, how do you function daily, you know, knowing what you know? Wow, the impact, I tell you, the bullet shattered the family structure, a death, a murder. It breaks the family down. I learned so much about different family members as it related to things, stuff, money. I learned so much. Um, the bullet, long term, 
destroyed my marriage. I had just got married May 1st, 2004, four months later, September 4th, September the 6th. I, um, I changed and, and I, and I'm recollecting a conversation that my then husband had. And he said, he just won his wife back. And I knew that she was gone. So I had to tell him, I, she ain't coming back. She's not coming back. I myself will forever be changed. I had to figure out what, what a new normal was. I had to pull it together because the first couple of years, and I'm not going to say days, so I'm not even going to say months. I drank to it because it hurt so much. I was broken. I'm now putting it back together. Um, but d- clearly, depending on my connection with the God that I serve, I'm a king's kid. I believe in Christ. I'm definitely a Christian. And I had to hold on to that. I, I was never mad, but I always wanted to, want, I, I was trying to understand why. And it wasn't until I had a conversation with the God that I serve. Why, why my baby? I did everything that I was supposed to do. I made sure that she had what she had. I made sure that I was attentive. I made sure I was present. And it wasn't until God told me that day in the bathroom, he said she wasn't yours. So I had to deal with the shift and the shift had to take place in my mind. The shift had to take place in my heart and the shift had to take place in my spirit. And it was a challenge. Stuff like that don't happen overnight. So once I received the shift, I then thank God for allowing me to be the one who carried Kendra. I thank God for allowing me to be her mom. And to be that vehicle to pour into her life. And the exchange was fair. So I don't ask those questions now. I'm just happy, glad that we were put together. And it was ordained by the God that I serve. And I call him Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Let me just ask you about Kendra's daughter. How is she now and and how has her life been? Well, at 15... Only, only if you live through it once, you live through it a thousand times. But for the most part, she's trying to figure it all out. We, um, and and I don't have a problem with sharing this with you. We recently had an outing, my granddaughter and myself, and I stopped at the dollar store and got some balloons and a a gallon of water. And I said, we gonna we gonna we gonna fill these balloons up. We went to the cemetery, and I said, Whatever's, whatever you're mad at, I don't care what it is. I want you to throw it at the headstone because I want you to get it out. And I'm going to do the same thing. And we did. And at first, she was acting like she was shy or what have you. And I said, I don't care what it is. I just want you to say whatever makes you mad. And the very first thing that my granddaughter said, I'm mad because I don't know why. My mother is the one that got killed. I'm mad because my family don't get along. I'm mad because it's taking so long to find out who killed my mother. That was devastating for me. It was hard to hear her say that, but I felt everything that she said. And I think it's important for her to release those things because there's a lot of other stuff going on with the hormones and the, the bullying and the social media attraction. And I listened to some of the music that she listened to so much. So I have to ask her, well, where you get that song from? So I tried to be as intuitive to her as possible. She's being raised by her dad. And that was the situation as well. I, I have no answers to the, to the different whys as it relates to my journey. I can only say that I'm doing the best I can with what I what I can. I had to go to court to gain grandparents' rights. And I had to do that early on. I mentioned before the Kendra's Home Going Service was September the 14th, 2004. Shortly after that, I was served with papers for a minor's property. Well, who does that? I, 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 really, I really just don't know. But I attained 
an attorney and I went to court and I fought. I am a fighter and I was granted grandparents rights. And at that point, that's something that wasn't that common, but I did it because I had to. I did it because my granddaughter is a part of my my daughter and that's also a part of me. And you have found some ways to manage the the pain and everything that you've gone through. You are helping others. Tell me about your efforts to help other people and to get the message out about what happened with your daughter. Well, for the 14 years, uh, I've been out speaking um, different engagements, speaking against the sensitive violence in the community. I was hands on with a, a lot of the different hearings as related to trying to get a forensic lab here, trying to um, get the message boards that you might see on the street, um, encouraging people to call 911. And actually, we didn't even say 911. We said 202-727-9099 if you have any information as it relates to a crime and not just a homicide, but more so a homicide. I was trying to appeal to the community that it does take a village. That's important to me. Moving forward, my vision now is to help surviving students of homicide with school uniforms. And the bottom line is, whether mom or dad is deceased or not, if they go to a D.C. public school, a D.C. charter school, or PG, which is Merlin school, they are required to wear a uniform. And just because mom and dad is no longer here does not mean that any surviving student should go to school with their head hung down because they can't have uniforms. And I'm not just doing one year. I'm following them every year until they don't have to have school uniforms anymore. I'm also trying to give surviving students, 12th graders, some kind of scholarship money. If they decide that they want to go on from 12th grade to the college level. And I'm not going to follow them just for the one, the first year. I'm going to follow them until they finish school. And I think that's important because education is the key. And I do believe that. My long-term goal is to have a case haven, which will provide a place for a family who just found out about a homicide to go somewhere where there's tranqu- tranquility, and just an environment where they can wrap their mind around the new normal. Because after after a funeral, a home going service, and people go out about business as usual, that's when the darkness comes. That's when you need somebody. That's when you have to say to yourself, it's okay for me to extend my hand so somebody can grab my hand. It's so hard for me. Even now, my girl, Courtney, will walk around out the blue. Mom, miss my sister. What do you say? What do you say? I can't. I miss her, too. But what what can I really say? So I, I try to stay keyed into her. She's 29 now. But even still, and even with myself, I align myself with other mothers. So when we have the conversation, I'm having a conversation with somebody who know, somebody who understand. Somebody who could basically feel comfortable enough to say certain things. The key, the key words that you just don't want to say to a mother whose child has been taken in that fashion. What's the name of the of your program? Or if people were to look, look it up, what would you call it? My nonprofit is Kendra Smith Family Lifeline Movement. What would you say to the person or persons responsible for the death of your daughter? What are your words for them? Wow. Hmm. I haven't been asked that before. Oh my gosh. What would I say? I would, I would probably, on me, I would probably say it was really your loss as well because I know I'm not the only one who lost Kendra. Kendra was a good person. She had a good spirit about herself and a friend to anybody. She really was. She had a sense of humor. She will make you laugh. She was silly as can be. Let's say the time came where you had to go into a courtroom and sit there and look at the person who you believe may be responsible for your daughter's death. If you're able to sit there and look them in their face 
and say something to that person, what would that be? Oh, wow. (laughs) I have sat in a courtroom and watched them and I said nothing. I said nothing because I really don't have no words. And that's that's the honest to God, because I can't say, especially with the Debbie would say, but the Deborah, who is biblical terms, a lot of things, (laughs) spiritual, (laughs) a judge, a prophet, a nurse, all those things. Um, I, c- I can't say that because those those are words that um, only a mom could know. Uh, a mom of a homicide victim <laughs> can say those things. Um, <laughs> that's a tough question <laughs> to actually answer. So for me, I, w- I would say no words. My eyes tell my story. And here's another question I have regarding the guy who they have in who they had in custody or who was charged with it. What is the situation now? Is he in jail right now or is he out of jail? He was released from jail the Monday before Thanksgiving 2018. The arrest was November the 1st. The arraignment was November the 2nd. And on the Monday before Thanksgiving 2018, He was released, no bail, no bond. What do you you think about that? I really don't know what to think about that. I, I do know that, or I learned, I'll put it that way. I learned that the judge who was presiding the case during the preliminary hearing was defense friendly. And I really believe that it was definitely... Her call, I since have a different judge, and that judge is riding along with what the first judge said. So he's out walking around free, and um, that's all I can say about that. It it strike me as being odd um, because I I was told that if you get arrested in Washington D.C., there's no bail or no bond. Now how? He slipped through that. I really don't have an answer for it outside of the fact that the judge favored him in that case. At any rate, I'm 14 years, 14 and a half years, still staying my course, still believing in God, still trusting that he did not wait this long to let me down. He will take me to the finish line. And I will find out what happened to my daughter. That's what I want. I reached out to D.C. Metropolitan Police about the case, and they sent me a press release that basically says that on November 1st of 2018, 47-year-old Tony Aiken was arrested and charged with second-degree murder while armed. He was being held without bond at the time. Then on November 19th, he was released on his own recognizances. Since then, the judge and defense attorney in Aiken's case have changed. On March 6th of 2019, he was indicted on the murder charges and Aiken pled not guilty in the case. I reached out to Tony Aiken, who's been out since November, for a comment of any kind about the case, and I never got a response. I also reached out to his last attorney of record, and still no response. Is there one last thing or one one message that you want people to take away from your story? Yes. I, I, I think that one thing would be is to encourage family members to go back to family, go back to basic, go back to what worked when we were kids, be engaged with your children, find out what they're doing, listen to their music, listen to the conversations when you're not supposed to, be, have them engaged in extracurriculum activities, make sure that you have a rapport with the friends that they bring home, with the teachers, make sure that you have that connection and and commune with them to, and do it as a family because it starts at home. That's that's basically what my takeaway would be. If you had a moment, if you had a, a minute, if you had any time to say anything to your daughter, if she's able to hear you, because I know she can, what would you say to Kendra? I love you and I'm going to make sure that Zaylin is okay. And I'm going to make sure that your sister is okay. 
and I'm going to be the best me that I can possibly be, and I'm going to make you proud. When it comes to my final thoughts about this case, there are a lot of questions left behind. Why was Kendra shot? What was she talking to her friend about in the car that night? And what about witnesses? How did police come up with enough evidence to bring Aiken in? I also think about Kendra's daughter who never really got to know her mother and Kendra's own mother who struggles with living in the area of where her daughter was killed every single day. I will keep an eye on this case and I'll let you know what happens next. And one last note, based on court records, a potential trial date for Tony Aiken is set for May 18th of 2020. If you have any cases that you want me to check out, you can reach me on the Intrigued Full Effect website or via email at intriguedfulleffect at hotmail.com. Until next time, be safe and stay true. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Intrigued Full Effect, Curious Cases, Disappearances, and Other Stuff podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the host. The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The host of this podcast assumes no liability or responsibility for any activities in connection with opinions shared in the podcast. The podcast and blog associated with it shall not be used in any legal capacity or as a basis for expert testimony. Any copyright material in the podcast is approved by the owner or as part of the public domain. Music by Pond5.